I will open the floor then um, for a conversation about uh, model uncertainty. Um, so I'd love to hear from folks out there. Uh, questions for the three speakers or comments in general? Thanks very much to the, the panelists for providing some really provocative uh, and interesting comments early this morning. I actually had a question, I think, for for Lauren, and, and and that's related to the models. I wonder if you integrated modeling you talked about, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sweet spot for the time scales of applicability of the modeling that you're doing, because it becomes challenging um, when looking at different systems. We talked about yesterday the fact that the the surface, uh, what we understand about surface water and the time scale for water flowing through a surface system is different than a shallow groundwater system is different from a deep groundwater system. And if one is combining those uh, models, for example, with uh, some of the climate modeling, we know that, say, seasonal to subseasonal modeling is very challenging right now. Um, so you have more, a better, better view for the longer term and some of the climate models. So when you're combining these models together, do you see a sweet spot for the, the applicability of the time scale uh, for, for the results of that model or, or where there are challenges in terms of, 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 of uh, bring, bringing the modeling results into uh, time scales that, that have applicability when we're trying to use them for decision making? Sure. So um, I think that there's a, there's a couple of important time scales to consider. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, they're already showing, like with um, the modeling that they're, they're doing in Europe, that if you're thinking about like weather time scale forecasting, um, that having the antecedent moisture condition correct is, is really important. And that's where um, they do get benefits from having this deeper subsurface included. Uh, I think that's probably like the the easiest one to achieve in a lot of ways because we can do a lot of data assimilation with that. Um, I think that incorporating better storage terms into the global models for like decadal scale forecasts is really important and that's where um, there's been a lot of work recently. I showed the example of Bridget's paper but there's been a lot of other papers mostly um, using GRACE showing that like these longer term storage trends that we're missing in our global models can be really important um, for controlling whether we have water energy limited systems. So I think that's where um, we can get the biggest gain from incorporating the larger storage term. Um, with respect to whether we do that with integrated modeling as opposed to some other um, more simplified approach that we incorporate into our land surface models, I think um, that probably will end up somewhere kind of in the middle because uh, we maybe don't need to be doing all of the complexity of like a really high resolution integrated model for our you know decadal projections when we have so much uncertainty in what we're going to do with pumping and, and all of those things anyway. Uh, but I think that we can use the integrated models to do a better job of understanding how we want those more simplified storage terms to behave. I mean right now if you look at like what we're doing with um, like that paper I showed from Bridget, like we're all over the place in how we're incorporating storage and what, what that's actually meaning um, for the, those trends. So I think that's like a, a big important area. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Riddell, NASA Goddard. Um, so uh, since Bridget's papers come up a couple times, I, I feel like I have to say a little bit about it. So Bridget and I are good friends and she's not here so I can say this. Um, but uh, when she was writing that paper, I had some serious misgivings about it because she was basically testing some models that were never meant to simulate trends on how well they could mm -hmm. simulate trends. It's kind of like, you know, I'm going to test these ride around lawnmowers and which one's the best commuter vehicle, right? And like, mm -hmm. of course, they're all terrible because that's not sure. what they're built to be used for. So, um, you know, so I think when we're looking at those, those models, I mean, of course, if we want to be better at simulating trends, then we need to focus on that. But we sh there's no expectation of what, you know, the ones that are out there right now should be any good at that. And it doesn't mean that we don't know what the trends are. I mean, we have, you know, Grace is telling us what the trends are, and that gives us a target. Um, but I, you know, I just want to make that point that, you know, just because, you know, this set of models that, that Bridget examined um, 
where it's all over the place in terms of in terms of trends that it's really no surprise because that's not what they're designed sure. to do yeah so um just like a quick re response to that yeah i totally agree with you and it's not my intention to throw those models under the bus and like they're they weren't built for that and that's you know it's okay if they're not necessarily matching that at this point um but a lot of people want to start doing that with models and that's like what what people want to start applying these models for so i think Bridget's paper is really important to still highlight the fact that we're not really, like, we're not ready for that. And I agree with you that we have um, we have the GRACE data to compare to. So we do know, like, what the right answer is over large scales um, for the period that we have the GRACE observations for. Um, but I don't think that the period of record that we have GRACE observations for necessarily represents the variability of the system. Um, and so I'm not sure that just using that that period of record to test whether we're getting like low frequency variability in storage dynamics correct that we could we could be really confident in our models just if we did a good job from 2002 to you know present and I, I'm, I'd be curious to hear your reaction to that but yeah I, I, I agree with you I mean it's a, it's a short period so obviously we don't know um, we don't have a good understanding of the longer period variability because we just don't have the observations at, at mm -hmm. the global scale um, and if that's something we want to be better at understanding then we need to you know develop models that are uh, you know whose purpose is to to understand long-term variability and you know starting with you know a lot of the models in that in that paper didn't even have a representation of groundwater so mm -hmm. You know why even bother? You sure. know if, you're, if you can't yeah. represent groundwater, of course you're not going to get the long period variability mm -hmm. right. And mm -hmm. you know, the, as you well know, there's you know, newer models that do represent groundwater, and those are the ones that we really mm -hmm. should be focusing on. And right. and uh, uh, you know, but it also comes back to the the inputs. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we can develop a model that's really good at representing you know groundwater or terrestrial water storage variability, but if we don't have good precipitation data for the last half century or whatever, then you know, you're still not going to get the sure. right answer. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's a challenge. And I think that as we're trying to add storage to our long-term projections, that that's like a big area of uncertainty. And that having the GRACE data for the period of record that we can evaluate our models that are really actually, because we do have, I mean, that was kind of like the beginning of what I was showing, is we do have large-scale models that are actually incorporating groundwater now. Um, but as we move forward to, like, figure out whether we're doing the right job when we're projecting out 100 years as we have a climate that's changing and recharge regimes that are changing and different recharge mechanisms, I think that's, like, a, a big uncertainty and an open challenge. I mean, when we go back to a more classical groundwater modeling type framework, like you know the use of mod flow type models for uh, groundwater management, uh, historically there's been an approach to parameter estimation, inverse modeling, you know, whatever, with in situ data that people had some sense of what the data really meant. Uh, where is the state of the art in terms of, you know? Uh, in data simulation, clearly, you like to have model prediction with prediction uncertainty, a measurement with less uncertainty that then hopes that you get closer to what may be a right answer. Uh, with remote sensing-based observations that are hard to understand, you know, what because a lot of surrogates that they're measuring and then you're processing that down to come up with an inferred quantity, where is the state of the art in terms of using large-scale remote, remotely sensed observations in a data simulation or inverse modeling approach for the classical groundwater modeling. Okay. Or are there any examples of that? that... Sure. I so I, I'm not an expert in data assimilation, so maybe someone else here will have a better answer than me. Um, oh, I have an answer. Oh, great. <laughs> Terrific. Go for it, JT. So, uh, so we we just had a you know so this is this is under underway right now so it's just getting started but we just had a project uh, funded by NASA's Applied Sciences program a uh, water resources program with with Brad Doran is the program manager there to work with in California with the USGS and the uh, uh, California Department of Water Resources DWR 
you know, California has this, I'm sure you guys have talked about it over, over the past few days, but this, um, you know, Sigma um, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act coming up where a lot of these critical groundwater management regions need to uh, demonstrate uh, compliance with, you know, sustainable levels of groundwater withdrawal uh, by 2022, I believe it is, and the timeline varies for different regions, uh, which includes uh, mitigation of subsidence. The subsidence is happening and is associated with unsustainable groundwater withdrawal. And um, so what this project does is we're, we're going to be taking the uh, Central Valley Hydrological Model, which is run by Claudia Font at USGS in, in San Diego, and that is essentially a version of mod flow, as I understand it. Again, not my expertise, but as I understand it, that's a version of mod flow, where they built actually a routine in the model to simulate subsidence. And I don't know exactly yet how they do that. I think it just has to do with, um, uh, uh, I uh, can't remember the I can't remember the phrase is uh, the relationship between the yeah, they can use the coral elasticity and you know. Assuming 1D vertical deformation, they can make a calculation with just fl fluid pressures alone. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so the goal for the project is literally that, is to take uh, great observations of course scale. Of course, they already incorporate well observations when they have them, and in-star observations of Poseidon, and to, uh, you know, the model's already kind of parameterized for the things, but just to, just to uh, kind of calibrate the model for different regions and get something, especially with Poseidon, that is kind of spun up for different uh, groundwater uh, management regions and, you know, is calibrated so that it can work properly. With Sigma, each of these, each of these regions is responsible to do their own groundwater modeling. So even though the USGS and DWR provide models, each groundwater management region is responsible to come up with their own plan and, and mm -hmm. own projections of, of how they're going to reduce, um, uh, you know, make, make pumping sustainable and, and mitigate. Uh, so, so that's, one project that just been started, but uh, I'm not aware of many others. Um, so this is a this is a follow on to what JT was talking about. Not as much an answer to your data assimilation question, um, but I do think that there's there's a big disconnect in the data sets and the methods that are used for our really large scale models and what we do for regional and smaller scale models. And that's true not just with respect to like inversion and what we're doing with um, geostatistics, but also with respect to what we do to water management because we have a lot of really great groundwater models that are built on watershed scales that are built in collaboration with the stakeholders of those um, of those areas that are using the water and I mean some of them are used in litigation or management or all these things. So I actually think there's a big opportunity to have a better better communication between all of the models we've already built at small scales and what we do at large scales where we're limited to um, just much worse data sets but we know in places like the Central Valley or the High Plains or we have a bunch of really heavily studied regions where we could do a better job. Yeah, just to add, that's something that the surface water community, the continental scale and global scale surface water community is also struggling with is these kind of different modeling communities, land surface modeling yeah. community, catchment modeling communities, they're all hurtling towards having scales at which could be applied at a management, uh, to, to answer management questions. And the struggle then is, are there common areas that can be tackled by all communities um, to try to make efficiencies in that? Things like data assimilation is, is certainly one of them. but. Um, that, that is something the surface water community is, yeah. is going to be facing as well. So one of the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Tony Guy Robertson, NGA. Just, uh, I guess the question I have for you then is the, 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 I guess, ability to do that data assimilation and that is that the lack of the data itself or is the lack of maybe metadata so that way people understand the data that is available and whether it can or can't work in their models? Um, I don't know that I want to answer for the whole community. I mean, I know that we already, um, so like the, the group in Europe, they're doing data simulation for soil moisture. And I don't know the details of exactly how they're doing that. Um, so I think, I, I'm not sure that there's like a huge barrier to entry just like with respect to data not being available or 
there not being methods, I mean, there's great data assimilation techniques. I think it's probably the limiting factor with respect to recharge and groundwater um, flow is that we just don't have a lot of data sets to assimilate. So we have grace, we have soil moisture, but in terms of like deep groundwater, it's, it's like what is the data that you're going to assimilate? So one of the questions I always uh, wondered was depth to water table, very simple question, is how easily is it available, A, and can we figure this out, not just in U.S., but globally? So, should I? It's up to, I yeah, mean, go I, for it if you I, want. Well, I just, USGS collects this data. We have it even at a 15-minute resolution in groundwater wells across the United States. But I think there is, I would argue, in the USGS, we don't put a lot of, we haven't had a lot of effort to try to understand how to extrapolate that across large continental scales. So I would say that the data is there, but the point you had made earlier, Venkat, about taking the data and then, you know, knowing what we're collecting it for and then understanding how, to, how it would assimilate into models, I think, is well well taken um, in that respect. So I think there has to be more work in that, those areas done. We also have areas where we do have groundwater, surface water, stream, stream gauging, and groundwater set up next to each other so we know exactly what's happening between those two um, data series, and there hasn't been much analysis of that. I think that's one of the criticisms we have internally at the USGS is we collect a lot of data, but we, we tend to not always be the best analyzers of our data. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, and I would also point out there is a global, um, Ying Fan did a global groundwater map. That's like, I would say, that's like kind of the gold standard, I guess, in terms of collecting all of the water table depth observations globally. And she has, you know, put them all together. She has a map showing the point observations and then um, created a water table depth surface with like just a simple model. Um, so that's like, what we have, and then all of the other large-scale models that get developed get compared to this, um, which is good and bad. I mean, that's, those are the observations we have, but also we know that, like, in the U.S., if you collect all of the water table depth observations, um, those are going to be biased to the places that we've drilled a lot of wells, which are the places where we wanted to use water. So we drilled a lot of wells. So um, I don't know if that really answers your question or not, but... I think that brings up a, another point that I had in my written comments, which is really uh, a lot of this comes back to like understanding data gaps and where there are funding or there is potential opportunity to put that next well or put that next stream gauge. It's, it's uh, that is an area where I've always I don't think has felt there's a lot of attention paid to that is really understanding the data sets that we have, not just using them, but understanding where the gaps are um, and then trying to look for opportunities to fill those gaps and particularly in places where you could. Uh, where there are challenging hydrology or hydrogeology or hydroclimatic regions that can then be used for extrapolation to other areas where we also don't have that data. So I think that's a big opportunity in general in our field is really how do we understand gaps in the network and then fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. And the USGS does have the, I can't remember the name of it, but the, uh, the set of groundwater observations that should be used for climate. That right, are, they do, yes. I yeah, can't yeah. remember the name of it right, right now, but. Yes, right. They do have a set of wells that they've kind of filtered out that right only have effects mm -hmm. of, of uh, climate. In but them. there aren't that many Right, them. exactly. There are not, yeah, there are not, correct. So, uh, Laura and Stacy, do you think that if you were to be able to pull together, just for the U.S. to begin with, all the well data, not just the US GS data, but the state permitted wells that people are actually operating and had this predictivity associated with them, power flow or mod flow models that are run at the continental scale might actually show some different results. Like is it worth doing to do to go through the effort of really pulling together all the vertical information that's in there? Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I think, I think that we would get different results because I think that what we're limited to, um, I would say more with respect to the hydrostratigraphy than the wells because the wells would really be, um, we have to know a lot more about management in conjunction with those wells if you're going to use the well information right. meaningfully. But I think the hydrostratigraphy is really a limiting factor in terms of you know mapping where we have um, alluvial aquifers, understanding the depth to confining units, like 
that's really important for getting groundwater configuration right over large scales. So if I could get one thing, that, that would be it. They would actually change what the model results look like. Should we put that on the NGO? <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. Actually, I'd like to step in and throw Burke under the bus for a second, which is that actually there's a really good example of this from Nebraska, right, where the USGS had, I don't know how many wells, but a ton of wells and uh, tried to calibrate a mod flow model, I believe, and still couldn't get those pieces right. Would you? Yeah, it's sort of, I think one of the challenges is in missing sort of the nonlinear non features in the subsurface, a little window in, in a confining layer that promotes flow through it might be missed with even a thousand wells. Um, so that was the value in providing high resolution geophysics was to identify the, the geometry of the aquifer system so that you can reduce uncertainties in making predictions in, in say, for example, a flow through a, a, a lens in a sand aquifer or something like that. But that example was pretty compelling in terms of the difference in the model performance after introducing those geophysical data. At least. Yeah, and, and I guess just to counter my own argument a little bit, I think a lot of these questions, and we talked about this in one of the breakouts yesterday, is that all of this depends on the question that you're asking, right? In some cases, maybe the hydrostatography doesn't matter and for, for a specific question. And so we, we try to produce models that can do everything, and that's nearly impossible because the world is too complicated to do everything. So we have to define these uncertainties, I feel like, about surrounding specific management questions and, and how do you do that effectively. Sure, yeah, and just to, to follow up on that, um, it really depends what scale you're at too because we talked about like preferential flow paths. Those are really important depending on the questions you're trying to answer. Um, but also if we're modeling at one kilometer resolution, like what does that even mean? And what is the hydraulic conductivity? Like what, is, what does that even mean physically? Like um, I think that if you can at least get a better job of getting the structure, like the geometry of it right at large scales, that that will matter. Um, but then at smaller scales, then we have like a whole other mess of complication too. Yeah, and just to add, so that's exactly the issue that we're in, what I showed in the Mississippi alluvial plain yesterday is that we have one kilometer grid cells in detail at much finer scales that shows there are features that are important. And so how do you bring in those uncertainties into a groundwater model? So is it, it gaps in physical processes that you can't represent or scales that you can't represent? What are the biggest challenges? I'm just wondering to, uh, oh, sorry, if some, I didn't know if someone else had their hand. But um, I'm wondering yesterday, since I wasn't here, were there, was there um, a discussion about the role of air, airborne geophysics or geophysics in general and the, okay, so, yeah, because I feel like we spent a lot of the morning talking about, you know, different types of data, but that seems to be one. I know particularly for this Mississippi alluvial plain, airborne geophysics has been really helpful in resolving a lot of the, the discrepancies in the hydrogeology, so. Manu, I think you get the closing. Yeah, sorry. Cl I, I closing bit here. a very simple one. Much of the discussion yesterday and also today didn't actually get into the types of aquifers uh, because traditionally we have also thought about the fact that you have you know sedimentary versus hard rock versus cars, and most of the comments seem to generally apply to sedimentary systems. So now I'm wondering that in many areas that are critical around the world, it's hard rock or cars. Do you guys have any thoughts on whether you have a decent representation of issues with those, or there needs to be a special attention given to those? Uh, so that's a great point. I think that a lot of the, the integrated modeling work is really focused on shallow groundwater because the focus is on like understanding what that means for our land surface connections and, and connecting like from the atmosphere down and, and working our way down. Um, but there's a whole other mess of questions for our deep confined aquifers where probably you don't need and like we don't need to have the land surface coupled for our deep confined aquifers like, for the time scales we care about. Um, karst systems that's like another giant can of worms. I think also um, I mean we can represent like mountain block recharge and mountain front recharge in our integrated models but I think that's also more of a um, more of a frontier area of understanding what, how important those really deep long flow paths are um, and the relative importance of mountain front versus mountain block recharge. So um, that's a really good point. And I think that the, the tools and the modeling for those other systems are probably a little different. And, there, and I don't want to imply that that's also not being done. Like there's groundwater hydrology 
and groundwater hydrologists have worked on karst systems and, and deep um, confined systems. But it's like kind of a different group, I would say. Now, my main reason to highlight yeah. that again is Tony's yeah. question from yesterday. Yeah. It really becomes critical, in the, you know, from the human perspective, that's the areas mm -hmm. which are important. And yeah. You're not in Yeah. Yeah, there's a bias. Um, in the interest of time, I will unfortunately have to cut this conversation off, but thank you guys very much for your participation. And uh, we are going to head towards our breakout sessions. And um, I think we all know, hopefully, where we're going. So um, take a few minutes, take a break, and we'll see you in those rooms. Thank you. <laughs>